Advanced Metaphysics, a lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee. Electrons. In the Bohm model of the atom, we see here the magnetically attractive atomic nucleus surrounded by the magnetically repelled electron cloud of varying orbital shell energy levels. Of course, we know this model is greatly oversimplified from the real-world orbital paths taken by the electron in its orbital shell. We can only predict these roughly using interactions from the photoelectric effect. Thus, as we see in the standard Bohm model, there is a substrata allocated in this diagram of mind between the positive nucleus and the negative electron and this inner shell reflects the ability of an electron to temporarily store a photon. First, let us examine the electromagnetic effect that causes attraction between atoms to form covalently bonded molecules. For the purpose of demonstration, we assume the magnetically positive poles to form an axis around the middle of which develops the magnetically negative electrons orbital shells rough equator. We see the magnetically attractive poles here in green and the equator of the electron shell at a right angle to them we see as a red circle surrounding the green line. Thus there are two forms of electromagnetic conductivity that can occur as a result of aligning electrons based on whether the electrons are aligned along the axis of their poles or along their equatorial circumference. When the wavelength is of magnetically aligned electrons that are oriented along their magnetically attractive polar axis, the result is called direct current, which offers unrestricted capacitance, limited in an inverse exponential amount by distance determined by the medium through which the electricity is channeled. The other form of electromagnetism occurs when the electrons are being magnetically aligned along their equatorial circumferences and is called alternating current because magnetically positive capacitance will alternate with magnetically negative resistance along this form of wavelength. Because the positively magnetic polar axis is perpendicular to the equatorial circumference, of the negatively magnetic electron's orbital shell. And because these can both be aligned into patterns along wavelengths by orienting them using magnetism, the electromagnetic force can be graphed as two wavelengths, as we see here in green for the magnetically positive polar axis, and red for the magnetically negative electron's equator, along a single central axis for both however, that operate at a right angle to one another. Because these combined forms of electron alignment according to magnetism combine to form the single force of the electromagnetic spectrum, and because of the discovery of the electromagnetic forces interaction with electromagnetically neutral photons, the so-called photoelectric effect, we cannot discuss the combination of these three components to form the electromagnetic forces full spectrum without discussing the photoelectric effect as well. To do this, we will next discuss photons, which combine with AC and DC forms of aligned electron wavelengths to comprise the full electromagnetic forces spectrum. Photons for photons, first we examine them according to a form of electronic schematic designed by Richard Feynman. According to Feynman's initial premise, a magnetically neutral photon occurs when a magnetically attractive positron combines for some period of time with a magnetically repulsive electron. We see here now, according to Feynman's model, a positron and electron can cooperate for a duration as a photon wavelength and then once again break apart to emit a single positron and a single electron. This positron-electron pairing may be what results in the effects we observe from the classical double-slit experiment. 
often touted as proving light acts holographically. It appears that when interrupted by interference with the solid material object, a photon wavelength will break into multiple parts, and each part will travel simultaneously through all of the multiple slits or permeations through the material interference. The light expresses this doubling effect in the form of losing half its luminosity, and it seems to be this that accounts for the inverse square law of light diminishing with distance from the source of its emission. Here we see a potential extended form of the double slit experiment using six material barriers each with either two or three permeations or slits. According to my predictions we can extrapolate various frequencies of wavelengths by controlling their refraction in this way. The resultant wave pattern formed on an emissions receiver at the opposite side of the interfering obstructions would have as many points of origin as obstructions and we can see using the six-walled form of the double-slit experiment that the emission spectrum on the receiver would resemble the hexagonal arrangement of the quantum chromodynamics applying to stable forms of quarks. To further break this model down, we can see how a wavelength divided by four layers of obstructive interference would refract into four points of origin surrounded by ripples outward of less and less often placed randomly scattered positron-electron repairings. Here we see that by applying this same method of light refraction using four walls of interference to graph a pattern on a flat receiver, we can measure a Lorentz transform of the surface motion on the topology of a torus aligned along a single axis penetrating it perpendicularly to its interior axis and to its exterior equator. The topological pattern of the torus, such as we see here, can seem complex. There is a horizontal wavelength penetrating the torus along its latitudinal equator in yellow. The outermost circumference of the torus is comprised of a coil that in the diagram is colored green from the outside and blue inside. The latitudinal spiral in red traces from the equator to the processing polar axis, the offset vertical angled purple line. The photoelectric effect. Having now studied how magnetic electrons behave in AC and DC voltage, currents and how photons combine a positron and electron that can be infinitely divided in halves, diminishing its luminosity according to the inverse square law. Let us now study the combination of the electromagnetic force spectrum and the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is known to us simply by colors. The wavelengths of photons that transmit light received to our eyes from all the objects we can see are caused to assume certain colors of the rainbow spectrum by the composition of the elements they are reflecting off of. This reaction occurs such that all the atomic elements and thus all the larger molecular forms of matter reflect one hue of light and refract it to bounce off at another angle and another frequency carrying a frequency of wavelength our eyes would interpret as a different color. The spectral chromatic effect can only occur because photon wavelengths of one frequency or color will reflect off electron energy shells of various different levels and sums of electrons on each per atomic element as a different frequency or color of light. The photoelectric effect can be modeled as I have here, using a green circle to signify the electron's orbit in its energy shell level, red to signify an approaching photon prior to impact with and absorption into the electron's orbital energy shell level, and blue to signify a retreating photon following ejection and emission from the electron's orbital energy shell level. 
This aspect of the photoelectric effect, that the massless photon is absorbed into the electron's energy shell for any duration at all, regardless of how briefly, before being immediately reflected off its surface, has long puzzled quantum mechanics. The frequency of the photon wavelength prior to impact appears as one chromatic hue on the visible spectrum and another after reflection off its surface because the trajectory of the photon wavelength is, for a fraction of an instant, combined with that of the electron inside its orbital energy shell. The result is the electron assumes mass enough to be measured during this duration while the photon and electron are combined. Such is the essence of quantum mechanics. This occurs along the electron's orbital energy shell level at an arc radian angle determined by a ratio of before and after collision trajectories of the light wave and thus its chromatic tone that quantum mechanics call theta. As theta diminishes asymptotically towards zero the closer to the nucleus the photon wavelength penetrates, the angle of refraction, denoted usually by phi, expands. The duration of time the photoelectric effect can last can thus also approach a zero sum. In this Feynman type diagram, I have attempted to model the photoelectric effect where T, its duration, asymptotically approaches a zero point at a right angle of origin. The electron is modeled as the green and red perpendicular wavelengths, while the photon is modeled as a single wavelength in blue. Quantum mechanics refer to the apparent zero time duration of the photoelectric effect wherein the photon is absorbed into the electron illuminating it prior to its being reflected off its surface in an altered trajectory quantum tunneling. Here is a model of quantum tunneling that may be applied on an intergalactic as well as subquantum level. We see a negative electron and a neutral photon can combine to form a positive quantum tunnel which acts in a large enough mass aggregate like a wormhole that cuts vast distances in space down to approaching zero duration travel time. To return to the photoelectric effect, we find that the frequency of a photon wavelength translates into the momentum of the photon particle during the zero time event while any photon collides with any stable electron energy shell. The momentum and trajectory of the photon particle combine with the prior trajectory of the magnetically negative electron to cancel its charge just long enough for it to be observed. In the same exact moment, the photon wavelength bounces off the electron energy shell with a frequency comprised of a combination of its previous particle trajectory and that taken by the electron orbiting in its energy shell. Following the photoelectric effect, the frequency and color of the wavelength is altered, and the electron ceases being a measurable particle and resumes its apparent occupation of all points on its orbital energy shell simultaneously. A light cone. First, let us consider the three possible curvatures of the fabric of the space-time continuum. All of these occur in different places in space, around various sorts of orbs or clouds. However, the one that adds up to occur the most determines the overall shape of the majority of the space-time continuum itself. The saddle form signifies a cyclical Big Bang and Big Crunch, alternating explosion and implosion of the entire universe. The sphere geometry signifies a single, fixed aspect ratio for the expansion of space over time, such that at a certain predetermined critical mass point, the universe would simply stop changing over time, and everything would hold still for eternity. The final potential geometry defining space-time shapes it into 
flat planes, usually in spirals, such as in the accretion of stars into spiral galactic disks and the double helix formation of molecules into biological DNA. This morphology means a timeline of perpetual expansion at a fixed rate. Secondly, we consider the method we use to slice backward in time through all these potential geometric patterns for the fabric of our space-time continuum, that is, creating a 4D cone with a circulating base and a singularity at its apex. The axis of rotation of the base is assumed to be a factor determined by the base's midpoint's relation to the conical apex. We call this axis the observer's line of sight. The circulating base revolves around the midpoint according to a trajectory determined by the angle of an axis connecting the base's midpoint to the conical apex. When we apply the 4D light cone method to measuring the expanding history of the universe, we trace the origin point of our continuum's surface to a central singularity, the Big Bang, and for shorthand depiction assume the traditional expansion model of a sphere. In this model, the curvature of present space-time causes a lens effect to occur as we look back through time towards the first spark of the Big Bang, similar to a double-slit experiment with no interfering obstacles. Modern cosmology has improved on this method only by modifying the curvature of space-time's effect on the model of the light cone to depict various levels at which the rate of expansion has slowed or sped up. It should also be recalled that, in different locations in space, various different types of curvature can occur as well. For example, in addition to the direct line of sight from an observer looking backward through time toward the Big Bang, we see the formation of wormholes, baby universes, and intergalactic alignments. These same effects can all be incorporated as occurring inside this model of my own design based on a strong gravitational curvature to the continuum's historical light cone caused between the Big Bang and the point of critical mass by the singularity of the Big Bang itself. The resultant curved light cone shows the division of the four elemental forces between the Big Bang and the point of critical mass. The observer's line of sight is shown as the dotted arc. In this model, also of my own design, we see the light cone history of the universe from the Big Bang until critical mass, in black, occurs inside a larger temporal pattern depicted as Aleph sub N in blue at a 45 degree angle and as Aleph sub Sigma in red at a right angle. This pattern forms the interior hole in the Aleph sub Omega hypersphere, depicted as a green circle. Surrounding this entire cosmological process is the Tau sub Tau tesseract, symbolizing the method of measuring time. Cosmological model. We begin from the furthest measurement outside of the pattern that comprises the history of our universal timeline, at the level of the Tau sub Tau tesseract, symbolizing the measurement of time over space. As we begin to zoom inwards, we pass the exterior ring of the Aleph sub Omega Taurus and approach the interior pattern of perpetual recreation in the innermost engine of our universal pattern. As we approach closer still, we see our present universe in the circle on the left of the diagram, the Big Bang Singularity event expanded in the central circle, and in the circle on the right is expressed a geometric representation of the Nulliverse on the opposite side of this cyclical pattern from our own present universe. In this excerption, 
of only the engine of creation pattern from the innermost core of the Tao sub Tao tesseract, we see the Big Bang and expanding singularity is given as the Aleph sub Sigma Taurus in red. The present universe and its warped light cone are depicted as the Aleph sub Zero and Aleph sub Infinity timelines on the half of the diagram in green. The nulliverse of pure antimatter zero point energy is shown as the opposite half of the torus in the diagram as the Aleph sub N sub torus in blue. In this expanded depiction of the geometry of the Aleph sub sigma warped torus form, showing the overall shape of the space time continuum as an expanded pattern over its entire cyclical pattern. We see the warped light cone of our own universe's history on the lower left, the nulliverse of ZPE on the right, and between them the engine of creation, expansion of the Big Bang event that began the expansion of our present universal singularity. Here we see only the heart of the engine of creation pattern, the expansion of the event of the Big Bang, beginning the expansion of our universal continuum from the pre-universal singularity. We see electric force lines shown as a torus in blue, conical magnetic field lines in red, and between them the warped saddle shape of a perpetually recycling continuum's geometry. Following from this, to the left side of the Aleph sub sigma torus diagrams seen previous, we return to the original warped form of a light cone model I proposed, depicting the division of the four elemental forces between the Big Bang and the point when the universe reached critical mass. Finally, expanding on the central circle showing the universe's complexification within a temporally stationary contraction of space, we find this torus seen from above the midpoint of its central hole showing baby universes occurring perpendicular to black holes interconnected by parallel dimensional wormholes in a multiverse of n potential alternative timelines. Multiversal time space defines the outer circle in this diagram and the inner circle depicting the torus shaped central hole represents the space-time speed of our own universal continuum's photon fabric. The Four Forces To examine the division of the four elemental forces of energy in the universe, following the Big Bang, but prior to the point when the universe reached critical mass and began to devour itself from within like a hungry stomach, we can use graphs such as this one with only modifications by myself from the original model proposed by Michio Keiku in his book Hyperspace. The evolution of the elements during the first Planck time following the Big Bang is plotted as proceeding from the upper left to the lower right along the diagonal of the square lattice. The first to form is Einsteinian gravity the so-called gravitational constant of general relativity. The second is Maxwell radiation, classed as photic and EM radiation. The third are Yang-Mills type particles, comprising the weak nuclear force of fission. The fourth and final to form prior to critical mass were the quark and lepton real particles of solid matter, held together through presumably, nuclear fusion. The question marks along the diagonal axis where the vertical columns and horizontal rows signifying the four elements intersect signify the energy level at which the elementary energy forces recombine and approach total reunification. In this diagram, an extension of the previous diagram to signify five elemental forces prior to the sixth state of critical mass, we find the traditional order of formation of the four forces following the Big Bang 
constituting the prime or fifth element. First, following the Big Bang, gravity formed, then photic light, then the nuclear force carrying particles, then quarks and leptons, and finally critical mass occurred. Replacing the question marks from the previous diagrams are miniature versions of a transform given by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. In this picture we see my own hand-copied depiction of this Hawking Penrose transform. This graph shows the way space-time drops off rapidly into a deep warping surrounding the event horizon of a black hole. Here again we see the form of a Poincare slice of a torus, the same results produced from a four-walled double slit experiment. By substituting the Hawking Penrose transform graph showing the event horizon's warping of space time surrounding a black hole for the previous question marked diagram, we arrive at this model where the one Hawking Penrose transform applies to the reunification energy for all four elemental forces. The results are the different warpings to the fabric of space time shown on the right. In this final form of the preceding diagrams, we see the division of the four elemental forces during the first expansion immediately following the Big Bang. We see the Hawking Penrose transform as the Poincare section of a torus, symbolizing the temperature of energy excitation at which the four elemental forces reunify. Gravity we see in black, electromagnetism in blue, fusion in green, and fission in red. On the left side of this diagram we see also applied the mnemonic pattern of expansion rate at which the four elemental forces divided from one another in their initial temperature conditions just after the Big Bang. Black Holes and Wormholes Black holes occur when a star grows old and large enough it implodes and creates a deep gravity well in space-time. Black holes swallow matter and energy and invert them into equal quantities of antimatter and so-called dark energy. This inflates a relativistically smaller singularity to form a baby universe inside each black hole. Wormholes occur on the surface of black holes event horizons and result in deep space gamma ray eruptions occurring apparently at random. These gamma ray eruptions occur in between them when spiral galaxies formed around the equators of black holes align with one another. In this diagram we see the poles of a black hole emitting gas jets that circle around in the deepest voids between galactic filaments to form baby universes. The angle of the gas jets bending around at which a baby universe begins to form is given as theta, the same as the interaction of the photoelectric effect in quantum mechanics. As theta approaches zero, the gas jets arc further and further out into deeper and deeper space, encompassing larger and larger arcs, interacting with and connecting them gravitationally to other distant neighboring galaxies. Here we can see how this process relates to our own Milky Way wherein the same gas jets that form the deep space baby universes, such as that on the left, connect in shorter arcs, such as those on the right, to our own star's poles, and from there to those of our planet, etc. In this picture we show the gravitic wavelengths connecting our star to the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. In green and blue, at right angles to one another, we see positive gravity waves A and B combining to form positive gravity field A in red. As the gravity waves emitted from galactic core by the central black hole there pass through our star, the Sun, they result in occasional reversals 
of the solar electromagnetic poles. Just as wormholes form on the surface of black holes at the cores of spiral galaxies, so too does the sunspot cycle reflect the effect on the north and south oriented magnetic poles of the black hole and all its galaxy stars. As the north and south poles of the galactic core's black hole process over time, they alter the effects on the sunspot cycle of their galaxy's stars that eventually result in electromagnetic polar reversal in stars and their accompanying planets. As the poles process their orientation over time, each electromagnetically reverses with respect to the others. For a planet in a roughly circular solar orbit, and for a star in a spiral galaxy, there will be a total of eight planetary pole reversals per every four solar pole reversals per each single pole reversal of the black hole at galactic core. EM pole reversals of the gas jets of the black hole at the core of a spiral galaxy occur when one galaxy aligns with another at a right angle. When the gas jets of two distant black holes align at right angles, a wormhole forms between our own universe and a baby universe between them, resulting in a gamma ray explosion in deep space between these galaxies. When an EM pole reversal occurs for a black hole in the center of a spiral galaxy, it promotes the precession of the polar axis and also results in a rippling effect as all the rest of the stars outward from the core of the spiral galaxy undergo an EM pole reversal at their own intervals. When two galaxies align at right angles from one another's core black holes, the galactic core's black holes poles reverse, and from there the pole reversal emanates outward toward the other planets in the galaxy's spiral accretion disk affecting first each star and then the planets of each star and finally the moons of any such planets that have any. Advanced Metaphysics A lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee